Good day, and uh, so good to be here with you and your places. Um, just a couple days ago, we uh, had our uh, annual celeb annual Remembrance Day, uh, November 11th. I, I hope uh, that you've had a chance to take some time, uh, set aside some time to remember the sacrifice of all the men and women and families uh, that have done over the years in different conflicts and wars uh, for our freedoms that we should never take for granted. Also, you know, this is, this is interesting. I've, I was looking at how many videos that are on our, on our YouTube um, site, uh, Redwater Alliance, and I think we're, we're pushing past close to 190 videos since we started uh, really just March of 2020. So I hope that you've been able to be blessed by them and share those with other people. Please feel, feel free to, you know, share your comments uh, and anything, maybe prayer requests, whatever you want in, those, in these videos. I'd be more than happy to pray for you uh, anytime. So today we're, we continue in the sermon series that we began in October 23rd, looking at some of the not-so-gentle things that Jesus said to people in this day. Back on October 23rd, we began with Matthew chapter 7, specifically verse 13 to 29, where Jesus spoke about wide gates and narrow gates. You see, Jesus was up front when he said that the way into his kingdom was narrow, and those who enter into his kingdom would find opposition. So for approximately three years, Jesus backed up his teaching concerning his kingdom with, with uh, signs and wonders, teaching, healing, casting out demons, and many would decide to follow Jesus. Yet time after time, the compassion and the tender Jesus would continue to say some hard things to those who were following him. Even to those who would come to realize who Jesus was, such as Peter, who by faith recognized Jesus as the promised Messiah of God. To anyone who would follow him, Jesus said, they must deny themselves. We said this before. You take up your cross, Jesus said, and then and only then follow him. The four Gospels, my friends, couldn't be clearer. For we see that many who followed Jesus in his day were not willing to deny themselves, were not willing to take up their cross, and not willing to follow Jesus to where he was going. David Mathis, in his article, When Jesus doesn't seem gentle, reminds us that Jesus was tender and compassionate, and he lived a joy-sustaining life, as Mathis put, put it. But he also said this, Mathis said, his tenderness, which we love and so desperately need, is all the more striking because of his toughness towards sin and unbelief. You know, Mathis is right, folks. It would be a mistake to read the gospel accounts of Jesus and skip over the sharp tongue that Jesus had for those who afflicted others. Our tender Savior overturning the money changers and sellers in the temple court. See, Jesus wasn't compassionate toward the self-righteous religious rulers of the Jews or wicked kings or injustice. Jesus all had some hard words for those who called, called him friend. Remember Peter? Peter, by faith, as we said, recognized Jesus as the promised Messiah in one breath, and then he tried to redirect Jesus from the cross. And, and Jesus rebuked his friend, and he said to him, Get behind me, Satan, Satan. And in due time, Peter, as we learn in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, Peter would come to understand these hard words of Jesus as love. Yes, Jesus had hard words even for churches as well. Check out Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Among his praises for the seven churches listed in that book, Jesus had hard words to say to them as well. Jesus had some hard words for families as well, as we will see today in the text that we'll be reading together momentarily. Hard words, yet for those who would heed his words, Jesus promised great reward. Why? Why did Jesus say these hard things? Well, Matthew said this, the tough side of Christ, the words and acts hardest on modern stomachs, is not the instead of his tenderness, 
but in service to his mercy. He doesn't rescue us to rough us up. He roughs us, roughs us up to rescue us. We need this Jesus, the whole Jesus, the real Jesus, both gentle and lowly and honest and courageous. Please turn your Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. We'll be picking up uh, in verse 25, reading to the end of the chapter. Luke, chapter 14, verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Verse 28. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way away off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? If it is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile, it is thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray together. Our Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for loose gospel. We thank you as we continue down this road here in the past uh, three weeks and moving forward to next week. These hard things that you said to your disciples and to the people around you, to the Pharisees. And uh, Lord, how they are impacting us in our time and place as well. Help us to, uh, Holy Spirit, understand this text. Help us to put it into our hearts deep and into our places where we need it the most in our lives. And that we would walk this out day by day so you would be glorified in all these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This week we find our text, as I already mentioned, in Luke's Gospel. And leading up to our text, prior to chapter 14, we find Jesus is on a journey, a particular destination. He is going to a particular destination for a particular reason that the Trinity in eternity past had formulated. And that destination was Golgotha, the place of the skull. There Jesus has set his eyes laser focused on and nothing would deter him from Good Friday. And chapter 14 begins on the Sabbath, it says, here in verse 1. And there we find Jesus is dining at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees in verse 1. And there was a man there suffering from dropsy, the text tells us. That's just another way of saying of edema. Edema, pardon me. The swelling of limbs due to inflation, uh, fluid retention. And Jesus asked the spiritual leaders of the Jews, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That's in verse 3. And they said nothing. So Jesus healed the man and sent him on his way. And then he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on the Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? Verse 5. Crickets. Matter of fact, the text tells us that they could not reply. Then Jesus tells them two parables. The parable of the wedding feast and the parable of the great banquet. And Jesus', Jesus point is this. These religious leaders, these Jewish religious leaders, in their self-righteousness sought the place of honor, of prominence, of prestige and power. They thought themselves highly esteemed in their own minds. And one can imagine Jesus looking straight at them in the eye, warning them, warning them, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Verse 11. One can hear the rebuke in Jesus' words when he said to the, these self-deceived religious leaders, I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. That is the great banquet, or as Revelation calls it in Revelation 19.9, the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
Well, this brings us to our text where the context informs us that great crowds had accompanied Jesus on his journey to Jerusalem and his appointment to the cross. Well, here in verse 25, we find the here in verse 25, we find the phrase he turned and said to them. And let's not fly past this phrase here in verse 25. I did at first, and I was glad that the IV, IVP commentary on this text highlighted this phrase and pressed pause and had me really think through it. I wonder how often you have thought how special the apostles were. Wow, that Paul was something else, wasn't he? Or maybe you said, as I have said, when I feel I've fallen short in my walk with Jesus, I'm not an apostle. I certainly cannot match Paul. Or have you ever said, I can't lead a Bible study. I'm not the pastor. I think we can all get into this kind of sour grapes theology. We forget that Jesus is God and that he calls who he calls for whatever role he wants for that person. And it's Jesus who will also equip you or me for whatever role he asks us to do. You see, Jesus didn't come to create an elite commando team. That's for the movies. Remember what he said to the Pharisees. Jesus, as the IVP commentary so aptly put, offered himself to all. And to all he was upfront and honest in his teaching regarding the destination and what that journey would entail for whoever would follow him. Well, we have a couple of questions uh, to prime the pump, so to speak. A couple of questions to ask. What does following Jesus really require? Because, friends, if you decide to follow Jesus, you have a, another question to answer. What does successful disi discipleship require? And whatever the answer is, it applies to both questions. Because if you say you are a follower of Jesus, then you are saying you are a disciple of Jesus. Follower, disciple, same thing. Jesus turns to the crowd and he said to them, verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, Yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Let me ask, what was the first thought that popped into your mind as I was reading verse 26? And yes, Jesus did say the word hate. Now, isn't that a hot button word in our culture today? It's being tossed around here and there for just about any reason. And the word hate today has replaced the other word that once was on top of the list of the most used word in the culture and even in the church, judge. Judge. And I'm convinced the most uses of the word hate in our culture and even in the church is applied incorrectly. And I think if we did a survey of the very first thing that popped in your mind when I read verse 26 just a few moments ago, you most likely misunderstood what Jesus meant. Why well, don't we take a closer look at this verb, this word hate. And the Greek word translated in the ESV here to, to hate is the verb meseo, meseo. And this word is used in the Bible in many different ways and applications. For example, for one who has a malicious and unjustifiable feeling toward others, could be an individual or a group. We see this when Jesus speaks of the persecution that would come to his disciples when he sent them out. For we read in Matthew 10, 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. And it's interesting to note that this is in the context of their own families handing them over to be persecuted. It's also used metaphorically. For example, in John's first letter, chapter 2, verse 9, John said, Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. And we could go on and on and on. The question is this. How is Jesus using the word hate in the text before us? Keep that question in the front of your mind. For you will see in verse 26, 
a contrast. We have families, we have moms, we have dads, we have brothers, we have sisters, and we have spouses, and we have children, and we even have our own lives contrasted with disciples of Jesus, followers of Christ. Friends, what does that mean? Well, disciples of Jesus have dads and moms and siblings. Disciples of Jesus are married and they have children. And Jesus is saying that those who call themselves followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, this is what I require of you, Jesus is saying. I require that you hate your dad, your mom, your spouse, and your children, and your very own life as well. And this word hate is not used in the sense that you might feel it is being used in. It's been used, as one commentator put it, in the sense of a lesser love. Jesus calls his disciples to nurture their devotion in such a way to him that their attachments to family and even their own lives would seem like hatred by comparison. But here's the the point, folks. Jesus commands that his disciples put him first in their hearts. First in their hearts must be Jesus. That our relationship with Jesus is first before all others. You remember a couple of weeks ago we were introduced to Pastor Afshin Ziafat. Pastor Afshin was born in Houston, Texas. He was born into a Muslim family, family pardon me, and one day surrendered his life to Christ. He was found out by his father, who, who, whom he respected and loved dearly and deeply. And it was because of that love for his father that he was tempted to turn back to Islam. You see, the ties of a family, of the family, are strong. Yet he chose Jesus, and in doing so, his father disowned Ashfin. So what excuses do we make that reveal that Jesus is not first in our hearts? Well, let me share a couple. How about, I have too much to do? The parable in chapter 14 provides us some examples which are easy to understand even in our own context. We see the invitations had been sent out for the great banquet. Everything for the banquet was ready and all was needed was for people to come to the banquet. But the excuses started pouring in. One said, I have bought a field and I must go and see it. Please have me excused. Verse 18. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. You see, Jesus here using normal, everyday kind of things in his time and place. And on the service, one could say that these were important, for of course we need food on our table and money in the bank. Yet, when the banquet came, they were busy. Business was, well, busy. Money had to be made, etc., etc. So here's the question. What is keeping you so busy that you miss out on the banquet? you have been invited to attend. I'm reminded of Martha and Mary. We find their story in Luke's Gospel in Luke 10. We find Mary sitting there by Jesus' feet, listening attentively to his teaching, communing, you know, in relationship with Jesus. And there's Martha in the kitchen and all over the place, running around, scurrying and serving. And she complains to Jesus and says, Hey, Jesus, don't you care that that Mary left me with all this work? And Jesus said to Martha, 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 you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Do you have too much to do? So much that you miss out sitting at the feet of Jesus? And doing things like, you know, reading your Bible and praying, just to mention some of the things that followers of Jesus should do. Well, what about this excuse? I need to focus on my family. Verse 20, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come, was this uh, person's excuse for not attending the great banquet. And I recognize that this is a very sensitive area for all of us. After all, the Bible from the very beginning highlights the importance of marriage, highlights the importance of family. 
For God created marriage in the family, and it's very important to him, as it should be to us. But not unlike the man who said to Jesus that he needed to go and bury his father, then he would follow him. And, and we see that story in Matthew 8, 21. Jesus here uses a parable to make the same point. There are those who are married who want to be excused from following Jesus. You know, excused from the banquet. They are preoccupied with their marriage. And, and the very vows that they made before God are the very things that keep them from God. Now, we keep in mind that this is a parable that Jesus uses here in chapter 14. So the wife of the man represent, can represent any one of our loved ones who place a demand on our time and our affection. And the husband in the parable really has no room for Jesus. And our families can make demands on our lives that tempt us to set aside our relationship with Jesus in some way, shape, or form. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Are our families, our friends, our relationship more significant to us than God? Well, let's go back to our text, verse 27. Jesus goes on to say, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. We've already talked about what the cross meant to the first century Jew and Gentile. Suffice it to say, it didn't mean something you wear around your neck. And this phrase, bear his own cross, is parallel to the one who hates his own life in verse 26 that we just looked at. So how are we to understand what Jesus is asking of his followers, of his disciples? Well, thankfully, Jesus provides for us two examples here in verse 28 to 32. One, the follower of Jesus must must count the cost, verse 28. And the example Jesus presents to us is very logical, and, and it should make sense to us. Anyone going into a building project sits down and sorts out a budget. You know, cost analysis, materials required, all that sort of stuff. And if one skips this groundwork, Jesus said that they may not be able to finish the project, verse 29. And, the whole, and all who see it begin to what? Mock him. Mock him. Two, the follower of Jesus must renounce all that he has. Must renounce all that he has. It says that right here in verse 33. But pastor, you say, what if one doesn't renounce all of it? Just keeps a teeny weeny bit a bit. Well, then you would be wise to sue for terms of peace. Verse 32. Because taking up your cross will be costly. Will be costly to the follower of Jesus. As we already heard time and time again, the narrow way is the way of opposition. There's no way around it, folks. It will be costly. One author suggested three ways that followers of Jesus, followers of Jesus take up the cross. One, the follower of Jesus denies themselves the very things that bring temporary pleasure, but eternal pain. The follower of Jesus denies their fleshly desires, and fleshly temptations, and seeks the pleasing and perfect will of God. Two, the follower of Jesus knows that they will suffer temporary pain for following Jesus. But as in the physical realm, where most anything that is achieved is best summed up as no pain, no gain, the spiritual realm is best summed up as no pain, no gain. Three, following Jesus means death. That is, daily dying to self. Maybe even, maybe even dying to self moment by moment, and maybe even dying, period. The followers of Jesus knows, the follower of Jesus knows that the Holy Spirit uses their circumstances to mold and shape the believer to become more and more like Jesus. And when the follower of Jesus is faced with insults, or physical challenges, or failures, or trials, trials, the follower of Jesus sees this as an opportunity to die to self, to die to pride, to die to ego, to die to sin. So as we bring this to, uh, as I bring this to a conclusion, it's a couple more questions to come your way to challenge us. How are you living your life? 
Are the things you are living worth Christ dying for? I came across a person by the name of John Stamm and his wife Betty. John was born in 1907 and he died in 1934. And uh, John and Betty were both American missionaries in China and both were martyred by the communists while ministering there in that land. John studied at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago and that's where he met his wife Betty and the China Inland Mission accepted the stamps for mission work in 1932. It was 1934 that they had a baby girl, and just soon afterwards, the birth of their baby girl, the, the communists found Bibles and, and Christian literature in their house, arrested them, and executed them. And John was just 27, and Betty was 28. Somehow, the story tells us that their, their, the history tells us, pardon me, that their baby daughter miraculously survived. One account of the life puts it this way, of their lives puts it this way. Quote, the Stam's powerful Christian testimony was carried to the ends of the earth by hundreds of secular newspapers, which featured front page, front page stories about the Stam's faith, dedication, and martyrdom. Many unbelievers turned to Christ. Many believers were so moved by the Stam's zeal that they became missionaries themselves. Another fellow by the name of Jim Elliott was a missionary to Ecuador. He was also martyred. He said this, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Let us pray. Father, this is, this is difficult things to hear. We are in always, it seems, in self-preservation mode. That's our f flesh. One of, it wants to preserve itself. It wants to save itself. It wants to be in a safe place. You wired us in many ways to either fly away or fight. But Lord, uh, the text here is clear. If we are going to follow Jesus, there are things that we have to set aside. There are things that will challenge us, that things will be opposing us. And I pray for each person that is hearing this. I pray, God, that you give them the strength and the courage to stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because that's the only way that we're going to be able to finish the race, as the Apostle Paul once said. To keep our eyes on the finishing line. Keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and, fin and finisher of our faith. I pray that we would do so. I pray that we would take every day, not for granted, but every day as a blessing and an opportunity to live like Jesus, to be living in the joy of our faith. And Lord, that we would be a people that love deeply, not only our families, but our neighbors. And that we would be there to help in any way that we can, but certainly with the gospel message. For without Christ, there is no hope. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks, folks. You have yourself a great rest of your day or week or month. And uh, we'll talk to you another time. God bless. Shalom.